Hey, what's going on, everybody? You're now tuned in to Fig Spell Tips, and of course, I'm your host, Coach Fig, and I'm back with another one. But hold on, we need a second. I gotta take time to thank our sponsors, okay? So I'm gonna start with, if you see the name, Rebellious Nature Games, man, your newest, biggest, up and coming independent gaming company in the game. Shout out to them for supporting the brand from day one, okay? I wanna shout out. The local electrician, Ray Boltonia, is bigger than a brand. It's a lifestyle. When things go wrong, Ray Boltonia is always near. And of course, <laughs> our refreshing beer, Bush beer, all right? Brewed here in the United States, okay? And why do I drink Bush beer? Because they're responsible for some of the household names that we've known for so many years, just like Budweiser, Bush, Michelob, Bud Light, and Natural Light, just to name a few. So when you're thirsty, quench your thirst with some nice refreshing bush. Hey, what's going on, everybody? You're now tuned in to Fig Spell Tips. And of course, I'm your host, Coach Fig, and I'm back with another one. And today, well, today we're getting back to the money. Why are we getting back to the money? Well, there's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of things that people aren't aware of uh, because the, the local media doesn't cover these things, right? You have got to do your own research, like I always say. So in this part, I'm going to give you guys a couple of things you might want to look out for and be aware of moving forward. And uh, hopefully I can help you diversify your portfolio so that you can have a backup plan so that when the, when the shit hit the fan, you're covered. All right. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about what our economy looks like down the line. Regardless of who's in office, there's things that took place already that are having an impact on our economy and will continue to have that impact until it finally stabilizes. How do you get ahead of it? How do you prepare for it? I'm going to break that down. What am I, what, one of the things I'm going to speak about is BlackRock. Um, most of y'all know the name, but you don't know exactly what they do or, or where they're from or, or you just kind of get the little bits and pieces here and there. There's a lot of misinformation out there, misleading information out there. And I'm just going to clear up a couple of things. Um, and I'm going to show you guys the stock market. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on Bitcoin a little bit. And I'm going to give you guys my counterpunch to what everybody says. So with that being said, I'm going to jump right into this. Okay, y'all. So this is um, a piece an article that's out right now, and most people obviously, like I said, you have to you have to look into these things. Stop stop worrying about what the new drops are. Start focusing on the things that actually impact you. Okay, and what does the headline? Um, what does the headline read? It says global risk. U.S. economy is headed for recession. Now, I've done other pods where I've touched on this topic, and you know, some people thought that I was a little loopy with it, and now looking at. Uh, the process that we don't gone through with the finances uh, as a whole in the economy, people were like, "Oh, you might have been on or something." But we are a resilient people, and we find we've managed to find a way not to completely go into you know a, a recession. Right, the um, the overall unemployment rate has kind of uh, stabilized for the most part. You know, it hasn't gone up any higher; it's come down some. So um, yeah, our economy right now is kind of staying afloat right now. But I'm gonna just uh, just. Pick a couple pieces of this article. I'll tag it in the description. If you guys care to do your research and read the whole article, by all means, it'll be available to you. So, once again, that headline reads, uh, Global Risk, U.S. Economy is Headed for Recession. Okay, so what does this say? It says, U.S. Economy Headed for, for Recession. Uh, for recession. Uh, converging global and domestic factors will cause the United States economy to experience a recession within the next 18 months. The looming economic crisis foretells a weakening of the domestic market and will become a prominent focus of the 2024 U.S. election debates. All right. So to break this down, and yes, you hear Trump speak about the economy over and over and over because of how it was when he got out of office versus to how it is. And, you know, I don't care who you're voting for. I don't I don't care what which side of the aisle you stand on at the end of the day. If your money ain't right, you're going to feel it. And so uh, what, what this is speaking of is going back to COVID. When COVID took place, it impacted our economy in the worst way possible. And our government didn't do us any favors by printing out $3.3 .3 trillion. I'm going to dive into this. 
a little more, I'm going to break it down, but I just want you guys to understand, this is what's impacting our economy till this day, all right, till this day. So let's break this down a little bit more right here. It says, uh, the U.S. economy will be simultaneously impacted by several factors over expenditures and dwindling funds in the aftermath of COVID-19 pandemic, vulnerability of big firms surge, and in oil and energy prices and inverted yield curve, right? So these are some of the things that are directly impacting us. In fact, not some, these are the major things that are impacting us because, again, that money that was printed out, that extra $3.3 trillion, it, it may have bailed people out in the moment, but we're going to have long-term effects. This is this is going to impact uh, people's retirement funds and, and all of the above. So this is why I always promote work for yourself. When you work for yourself, can't nobody fire you. And when you work for yourself, you can control your destiny. The idea of working to 70, uh, not 70, I think 68. And then, you know, the average life span, I think, of a man is at 75, 74. And a woman is 79. That's not a fair trade. If I'm going to give you all these years of, of work and then I'm only going to get to enjoy less than 10 of that, I'm not for it. But moving on. Um, it says right here, COVID-19 effects and inflation. It says the inflation spike that the U.S. experiences can be traced back to the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. The U.S. decided to print 3.3 trillion U.S. dollars, an estimated one-fifth of the money in circulation. This method, known as uh, quantitative easing, encouraged borrowing and provided uh, liquidity to the financial system. The Federal Open Market Committee decided on two interest rates cuts, returning the federal funds rate to a range of 0% to 0.25%. This stimulated consumption, but lowered the value of the dollar. All right, so yeah, in the moment you had more money, but on the world stage, the value of our dollar went down. So when the value of the dollar goes down, that means you don't have the same uh, uh, power in the in the world stage when you trade with other countries. You no longer have that that uh, the same. You don't get the same bang for your buck. It's like when you go to another country and you take a a, a U.S. dollar and you can convert one dollar into thirty eight pesos. It's because our dollar is greater. But the more we impact the value of our dollar, now you go to that same country with that dollar and then you might convert it to. 27 pesos and sure it's still a lot more in their currency and their economy but for us it impacts us because we now we now get less we now get less for more if that makes sense to y'all uh where was i at the mm, lower the value of the dollar leading to inflation in june 20 in june 2022 the u.s experienced a 41 year record high inflation rate of 9.1 inflation rates have since dropped considerably. However, consumers continue to struggle with the 3.7 consumer price index increase from September 2022 to September 2023. This is due largely to diminishing household incomes and issues in supply chain. All right. Diminishing household incomes is due to what? Is due to unemployment. People aren't uh, and, uh, aren't working like they were. People aren't earning as much as they were before. So it impacts your household. So yeah, you you're gonna feel it. You're gonna feel it from all from all angles, all all four fronts. You're gonna get you're gonna get the hit. Um, it says the inflow of cash has also led to market volatility. The stimulus money that citizens receive during the crisis mostly run out uh, runs out. With reports showing that the the least privileged eighty percent of Americans have less cash on hand than prior to the pandemic. So what they're saying is that. 80% of this country, of America, 80% has less cash, has less money readily available than they did prior to the pandemic. So you would think that by printing the $3.3 trillion, it was supposed to give us a boost. It did in the moment, in the moment. Now we're dealing with the effects, the long-term effects, okay? Um, what are we looking at here? Let's break this down. So it says a big, a big firm turmoil and layoffs, which goes right into what I was just saying on my own right here. It says, uh, many companies are initiating layoffs as they shift to AI powered work, which will temporarily lead to a significant increase in unemployment until the work sector adapts 
and finds new ways to employ people. Job loss will contribute to lower consumer spending and an overall slowdown of the economy. Why does that affect the economy as well? If you're not working, you ain't got money. If you ain't got money, you ain't shopping. If you ain't shopping, the money is not going back in. That's how it works, right? You, you get paid, you go buy something. When you buy something, they give you something. You get what you need and they take that money. They put it right back into, into their funds. So sure, there's a percentage rate that they keep as profit, but they also have to take a certain percentage out of that out of that money so it can go back into the budget so they can restock their goods all right that's how it just keeps on it just keeps on and it keeps on so if people aren't working and they aren't buying it's going to impact the entire economy all right uh says tech companies alone have cut 253,000 jobs in 2023 simultaneously big companies have experienced a decline in economic activity which obstructs their hiring process, leading many uh, leading many consulting firms like McKinsey, Bain and & Company, and BCG to delay start dates for new hires. So because the money is not there, they can't hire as fast and they can't get people going as, as, as frequently as, as often. And you heard that AI, right? So because of AI, the tech company, which is interesting because you use tech, to design and develop AI. And now they take AI to get rid of the tech people. It's kind of weird how that world works. That's not my space. So I don't really know. But I do know that someone in the tech world helped develop and design AI. And now AI is responsible for getting the tech people out of there. Crazy to me. It says 253,000 jobs. And this was in 2023. So I guarantee that if I dug a little deeper to the current date, that number is a lot greater. 253,000 people without jobs. Think about how that impacts the economy and everything else. Uh, it says uh, U.S. Uh, you know, companies will experience turbulence due to domestic and international economic instability, which will be further exa exaggerated as half of the large and mid-sized banks in the U.S. begin implementing stricter requirements for commercial loans. What's a commercial loan? Well, that's for people that have uh, started um, a business. So you, you have a business and you got a good flow going, but you need that little extra financial push, that little financial cushion so you can maybe order more. You can meet the, the demand faster, right? So let's say people start doing T-shirt printing, right? So you got a T-shirt company and you're probably doing 100 shirts a month, let's say. And demand is picking up, but you can only buy as you get. So you can't go out and say, let's order 500 or 1,000. So what do you do? As a small business, you get all your documents in order. You go to the bank and you show, hey, this is where I started. This is where I'm at. This is the demand. This is where I could be. If you allow me the funds necessary, I can get here. Banks love that. Why? Because... That means more money for them. The more money you make, the more money they get. Okay, they'll lend you the money, they'll get their money back on the interest. That's typically how that works. So, uh, by them making it uh, stricter for pe for people to get commercial loans, it means that it's again, it's it's going to also impact small businesses. If you're not already established, if you're climbing that ladder, if you're building, you're starting something from from the ground up, and you don't have the capital. It may take you longer to reach your, your ultimate goal. And uh, potentially, if you're counting, if you're banking, or you hear these people uh, click the link and guarantee 50000 If you If you're counting on that to be the success of your business, this may not be the time for you. Okay? So, it says uh, energy, uh, energy uh, prices spikes, right? So, it says... Oil prices also indicate a coming recession. A barrel of oil has risen to 95 US dollars in October 2023, up 25 US dollars since summer 2023. So think about that. Summer 2023. So what are we talking about? June, July, August, October, October, uh, from the summer. So you're talking about two, three, within two, three months, a barrel went up by $25. That's why everyone feels it when you go fill up. Right now, it's almost election time. So yeah, the prices come down. Don't be fooled. This is all part of the system. Don't be fooled. Okay. 
It says the price is projected to increase even further, which we all know because if you drive a car, you know every time you got to fill up. Back in the day, there was a running joke that said, I don't care how much gas costs, I'm putting $20 and that's all I'm going to put. Back in the day, you could put $20 and get a half a tank. Nowadays, you, depending on what you drive, $20, man, pff, good luck. Good luck, all right? So uh, what it says, it says, uh, the sanctions that follow Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine will continue to, incre uh, to increase crude oil prices to replace Russian sources. The West turned towards Saudi Arabia for oil. However, Saudi Arabia and the organization of the petroleum export countries Agreed to 1.66 million barrels per day decrease. Decrease. That means we're going to get less. So when you get less, it costs more. It's all about demand, right? So if you have, going back to like the t-shirt company, if you put this t-shirt out and it's it just flies off the shelves and you got to restock, you know, I got a hot item here. You can adjust that price. You can adjust that price. Now, if this shirt, you put it out and it's just sitting there, it's barely moving, then you get the, the sale price. You get the buy one, get one half off price. You get, you know, select items. This is how businesses survive bad products. So it's the same thing when, when we're discussing the fuel, right? If, if we can't get the amount of fuel that we need consistently, then how does that impact us? Well, we can't produce it as fast, and therefore, if you really want it, you're going to really have to pay that price, okay? So it says here, in conclusion, it says, the post-COVID economic backlash in conjunction with faltering external economies and, go and global conflict will directly impact, impact U.S. domestic interests, foreshadowing an emerging recession in the next 18 months with implications for consumers and investors both in the U.S. abroad. Is this guaranteed to happen? No. It's just the, the reason I, I bring this up is because we hear about it and we see it, but we see it in small portions, right? And unfortunately, it's usually how it happens. It goes little by little, little by little, little, and then eventually, pow, it just happens. And you go, whoa, where that came from? Well, it doesn't just happen overnight, okay? Uh, we won't hit a recession overnight. The, con the economy won't collapse overnight. It's, it's literally step by step by step by step. So how do you protect yourself from, you know, falling through the cracks and suffering uh, uh, through this? So a lot of people will tell you to invest in stocks and bonds, right? Well, most people, the average man, the common man doesn't know about stocks and bonds, right? So what they tell you, they'll say the Dow Jones is up, uh, uh, NASDAQ is up, S&P, right? Do any of y'all know what that is? Majority, majority of individuals do not know, right? So if you don't know about the stock market, you don't know how to get into it. You don't know how much it takes or, or how, to, how to manage it. You don't know what's good and what's bad. Then you go, that's not for me. Okay, understood. So then what's the, what's the next move they'll tell you? They'll say Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Yeah, people on, on social media, you know, flexing, right? Showing you all this money they're getting from Bitcoin, right? Okay, so uh, I'm going to jump right into this, this article that I, that I have pulled up because I want to show you guys why I tell people don't invest in Bitcoin, okay? First of all, for me, a good investment is something that you can, one, rely on, right? It's not determined by what the market is doing. It's something that you know for sure. It's like service for service, okay? And when I say service for service, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to provide this service. You can invest into a product that has a high demand, right? Like real estate. But real estate takes a lot of money, right? You need money to get into real estate. You can't just show up to real estate with a couple hundred bucks unless you got like a group of friends and then even with that now that just minimizes your profit right so okay real estate not on the table understandable why most people stay away from it cool bitcoin for me it's not the way and I, I, i'll tell you this is how this is how people will uh let, let me see i'll pull it up right here this is how people get you intrigued right because they'll say well bitcoin where we at right here? Yeah, they'll say Bitcoin, you can have 
uh, uh, trades five to ten dollars. It doesn't cost. It doesn't take much. Okay. Yeah, you're right. But if you're really trying to turn a profit, you really want to get something good out of it. You got to put enough money into it, right? So um, this is article I pulled up, which again I, I will put it in the in the description right here. And this article reads, it says, how to start investing in cryptocurrency, a guide for beginners. So you come across and you go, oh, wow, this, this might be what I need. All right. So what is that? It says five steps for investing in cryptocurrency. I'm going to read and you guys let me know if you catch some of the red flags that I catch immediately. It says, first things first, if you're looking to invest in crypto, you need to have all your finances in order. That means having an emergency fund in place, a manageable level of debt, and ideally a diversified portfolio of investments. Your crypto investments can become one more part of your portfolio, one that helps raise the total returns. Hopefully. Hopefully. Okay. So for starters, um, if you're dealing with the current uh, finances in the economy that we're going through right now, then when this says right here, it says first things first, if you're looking to invest crypto, you need to have all your finances in order. 80% um, of this country does not have their finances in order. So this is just for me, just an automatic red flag. And then when it says, hopefully at the end of that statement, that also was a red flag for me, okay? So then it says here, it says, pay attention to these five other things as you're starting to invest in cryptocurrencies. It says one, Understand what you're investing in. That makes sense to me, right? And I tell people all the time, you should know what you're putting your money into so that way you know how it works and, and how you can realistically expect it to come back to you. So, yeah, understanding what you're investing in, I'm with that 100%, okay? Then it says what? Uh, remember, the past is the past. Why do they say that? Oh, well, because you could have had a bad week and now you're scared to invest more into the cryptocurrency. As a smart person should, you might say, I don't think I want to throw any more money away, right? But they'll tell you the past is the past, right? To kind of encourage you to keep putting your money in there. And then don't forget, at the very, very beginning, they told you, they said that means having an emergency fund in place, a manageable le uh, a level of debt, and ideally, a diversified portfolio of investments, right? This is what they told you up front, all right? Moving on, it says watch uh, the volatility, all right? So what, what does that mean? It's uh, some, some things you can invest in, and it's like spikes, right? It just spikes, and you're like, oh, wow, it's doing really good. You put your money in, and then it just drops, and then it spikes, and then it drops, so what you're really looking for when you want to invest, if you're going to take that approach, you want to look for consistency. You want a product. You want something that you can put your money in. That It's not always high. It's not always, but it's steady. It's stable. You want your money to keep kind of working and keep flowing and keep flowing. You don't want to do this at noon and be here in the evening. You just you want that consistency. That makes sense. I understand it 110%, right? Then it says, manage your risk. Manage your risk, right? So once again, that part of that would be um, if you see a, if you see something that it isn't steady, but you like the way it spikes. The spikes are are high, more frequent than they are low, and you say, I want to, I think I want to take a chance on that. Well, managing your risk would be not to throw all your money into it. That would make sense to me. That's how you would manage that risk. However, I would personally tell you how you manage that risk is just by not investing into it for, in the first place. I'm going to give you guys what I recommend you do on the back end or outside of cryptocurrencies and stock markets. And then it says right here, don't invest more than you can afford to lose. More than you can afford to lose. I'm not a fan of that. That for me is the ultimate red flag because what you're telling me is that what I'm putting in, I have a greater chance at losing it than I have, you know, to uh, uh, making it grow. And that for me, automatic red flag, it instantly pushes me in the opposite direction. Um, simply because that's not what you, when you think of an investment, you think of profit. You don't think of loss. Okay. And people say, oh, anytime you invest, you take the risk. Yes. And no. 
There's certain things you can put your money into that are guaranteed going to bring you money back. Like what? Again, the housing market. People always going to need a place to live. Worst case scenario, if you can't rent it out, you can always sell it. And then you can just keep the equity from the home. So don't sit here and think that uh, putting your money in this digital currency is going to be better than having a physical asset, something that's, that's physically readily available. Now, how do I recommend you combat such a thing? Well, there's many products that people use on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can buy these products by bulk. And then when you buy these products, you can then resell them simply, like I've said for the longest. Just go back to the earlier pods and I break down. You can uh, create your LLC, right? You get your, your EIN number. You get your formation set up within the state that you live in. You set up your online store. Right now, the biggest platform is obviously going to be Amazon, right? So I'm going to tell you guys. Run through Amazon. You can use Etsy to create your own store, but I would say create a platform where you can um, kind of ping pong from between your personal and your Amazon account, and this will keep the money flowing, all right? So how much would it cost for you to invest into Amazon? Well, on the low side, you're looking at about 500 bucks, and that's going to cover you the fees and things of that nature that are affiliated with having um, a store with Amazon. So what happens is you're able to find a product. So water, people people buy water, uh, baby diapers. It's football season right now. So uh, team banners, right? So you can buy it wholesale. You can just buy it when it's out of season. Wait for the season to be over. You can just go buy a thousand Banners of random football teams. You don't even have to like the team. Think of the popular teams, right? Think of like the Ravens. Think of the Chiefs. Think of the Bills. Um, uh, I don't know. Think, just think of the popular teams. Whatever teams you feel like have a really big fan base or a loyal fan base, the Raiders, the, those teams. Don't think about if they're good or not. Just think about if they have a good loyal fan base. You go invest into random things. So uh, they have like little jackets and sweaters for, for pets. They have... Uh, coffee mugs, they you name it, they have it, right? Why do you invest into that? Well, you get a lot of it for a little bit. And then you just put it up online. And guess what? When people go look up because it's going to be game day or they're hosting a party at home and they want to get all these decorations and, and, and just random items, they want to gift someone something, they go look it up. And guess what? You pop up and you have exactly what they're looking for Ready, ready to go. And guess what? They'll just start buying from you, right? It's on Amazon. But when they buy from Amazon, sure, they'll take their percentage, but then you get the rest and you just repeat and repeat. So you can do that with food. You can do that with sports. You can do that with electronics. Now, I'd be careful with what electronics you get involved with, but you can do it with electronics. Remember, if an item gets returned because it doesn't work, uh, or anything like that, then that means that you have to refund that money. You don't get to keep that money. So that's that's one one aspect of it that I would tell you guys. I would certainly look to stay away from uh, electronics. But think of like how many holidays you have, right? There's Thanksgiving, there's Christmas, there's New Year's. You can you can literally put your money into these things that don't cost much. You can buy them in bulk, and then you can submit them. You can put them on your online store, and guess what? That money will come to you while you you could be dead asleep, waking up and saying, oh, yeah, you just made $1,000 overnight. It's that simple. It's that simple. That, to me, is a better investment than to say, put your money into crypto. Sure, crypto might spike and you might catch that wave and, and you might go from a couple of dollars to a couple thousand, couple hundred. Maybe they say some people make a million dollars. I've never witnessed it with my own eyes, so I won't speak. Uh, on it as if it's true or if it's false. However, what I do know is that this is that steady grind. This is that passive income. This is that money you can make while you're asleep. You're never going to wake up. When you invest into something like this, you're never going to wake up and go, oh, where did all my money go? You, go? you can only wake up and see how much money you recovered from your investment. 
you will not wake up and see how much more money you lost after putting it in, if that makes sense. So yeah, I would recommend you guys to, and it's super simple, super simple to go online, go to amazon.com, right? And then you can just go and just follow the prompts, man. Go to the menu. I'm not going to break it down for you all the way. Just go there and do your own due diligence. Break it down, set up your little online store. And guess what? Let the money come in. Let the money come in. Now, uh, let me see something right here. Right? Where we at? Where we at? So that's uh, that's that's one of the things that I would say to invest. Now, let's say you got a couple dollars. Let's say you got a. Let's say you have a little more than the average. So I tell people because again, if you guys have been paying attention, I found my way into the business world through the transportation industry. I was a truck driver initially. And I started to put the dots together. And I said, well, if they can pay me this much, how much are they making? And then just connected all the dots. And when I figured it out, I was like, I'm in the right industry, but in the wrong lane. I shouldn't be driving for anybody. I should be driving for myself. Rest is history. So I would say I would tell you all to um to invest into a transportation company. And there's so many layers to it. By the way, if you guys are interested in learning how to dispatch, uh, how to become brokers. If you need to uh, learn uh, or you need help with your formation, whatever it is that you may need, I'm here for you, all right? Simply shoot me an email, facepotips at gmail.com. I'll respond to you. You guys can DM me on Instagram at facepotips. And however I can help, I'm here to help you guys, man. I have a um, dispatch, uh, dispatch 101 course that's being put together. And once I have it completed, it will be available. Uh, but... For, for right now, if you have questions, this is the time to get me. Because once my course is done, I'll still be available to you. But then the course will be for sale. Okay. I am still a business man. I'm still a business oriented individual. Okay, y'all. So with that being said, I would tell you to start uh, a truck company. I would, I would tell you to start a truck company. Okay. If you have the money. Okay. Don't sit here and go off of these guys on YouTube that say, Oh, I made $5,000 in 12 hours. It's true. It does happen. But it's not every day. It's not all the time. Especially not those Class B uh, CDL trucks or, or the 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 under 26,000 pound, 26 foot lift gate box trucks. That's, that's very hit or miss. Sure, you can make money. You will make more than a regular nine to five. And the best part about it is you'll be working for self. So you don't have to really... Worry about all that. But if you really want to get into it, invest invest into uh, the different layers of the industry. Like I said, this dispatching, this brokering, um, really learn, like get in touch with the FMCSA, really learn. And this is stuff that you can do for free. It will not cost you anything to learn how to dispatch. To be a broker, it will take, it will take you some money because you're going to have to get insured and bonded to do that. And uh, to, to uh, safety and compliance. Get in tune with the FMCSA, like really learn the rules and regulations to the FMCSA. And once you get that down pat, guess what? Now you can provide a service to other companies that don't have it. Learn bookkeeping, learn accounting. If, you, if you're good at that already, these are services you can provide for companies that are running but don't have it already in place. All right. Again, passive income, passive income as a dispatcher making seven to 10 percent off of each truck that you dispatch, if I'll give you basic numbers. If that truck is averaging ten to fifteen thousand a week, that means you are averaging a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars per truck. So that means that if you're able to get multiple owner operators and dispatch them successfully at that rate, if you do as little as four, if you do four owner operators at that rate, you can make between four to six grand a week. I'm not making it up. Like I said, my course is on the way. And if, if you figure it out beforehand, great. If you don't, it'll be available to you. It'll be a step-by-step -step guide and you guys can take advantage of it and, and see how, how it benefits you or if it don't benefit you. But this is one of those industries that ain't going nowhere, okay? Your food, your clothes, your cars, your homes, everything comes off the back of a truck. If those trucks stop moving, this country comes to a complete stop. And that's why it was so important when they was talking about the ports closing and them trying to strike and yeah, they had to get paid because if they don't offload those boats, those trucks don't get loaded and then your, your shelves stay empty. That's how that works. So those are two, two 
ways that I would tell you to invest past. Again, if you have a large amount of money and you want to start a truck company, great. I, would, I wouldn't tell you to buy a truck right away. I would say rent, get a feel for it, actually learn all the overhead, right? You have maintenance, you have repairs, you have truck payment, you have insurance, driver pay. There's so many other expenses that come attached. So don't think that that as an owner operator that the 10 to 15,000 is what you keep. You got to cover your own taxes. This a lot again in my course all of this will be broken down and it will be made available to you. I'm just giving you guys free game right now. Me personally, if 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 I'm the guy helping you put your money, I wouldn't say take 5,000 and put it into stocks or put it into crypto. I would say take 5,000 start a truck company. I would say take 5,000 put it into Amazon and let that money work for you. The beauty about starting a truck company, you don't even have to drive the truck. You just have to put it in place. I'm, I have a full breakdown on how you can start your company and scale your company in many different ways. And so once this put together, like I said, if y'all if y'all want to get it, man, it'll be available to you guys. Uh, but for now, this is all I'm going to give y'all. If y'all don't want more info, like I said, y'all can email me at fixbotips at gmail.com or y'all can DM me on Instagram at fixbotips. And uh, moving on, BlackRock. Um, BlackRock, why do I bring up BlackRock? Because BlackRock has... Uh, is going to support, they're going to back everything that I just said to you guys, which is invest your money into something that uh, it's physical, something that you know is in demand, something that you know is going to be needed. So there's been like a big old concern everywhere because BlackRock has been accused of, of purchasing a bunch of single family homes and quote unquote making it difficult for the average American or the average individual, should I say, to be able to purchase a home, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you guys some facts behind that to actually clear that that misconception. But I just want you to know that BlackRock, uh, it says right here, BlackRock's assets under management rose 2.4 trillion to 11.5 trillion. All right, so they were at 2.4, they rose to 11.5 trillion, and net inflows came in at. 221 billion, okay? And that's both the highest all time for them, right? 11.5 trillion. You think that's stock money? Sure, they got, don't get me wrong, BlackRock does have their money in stocks as well, but they have a, a dedicated team and group that does that. They have 11.5 trillion dollars. Yes, they're in a position where they can take those chances. If you have $500, if you have $1,000, you're not in a position to put that money into a stock and wake up tomorrow or, or end the day with it being at zero. That's that's what I'm getting at, okay? So it says here, BlackRock and housing, setting the record straight. <clears throat> Recently, BlackRock has been the subject of speculation, um, uh, misperception, and even mistaken identity, identity in media reports and on social media regarding our role in the U.S. housing market, okay? Because again, a lot of you folks get your news from social media. You don't actually do your own research. You don't actually you know, dig into these things. So it says, we want to make it perfectly clear. BlackRock is not buying individual houses in the U.S. You got to understand, this is an 11, what, 11.5 trillion dollar company. Yeah, they're not they're not putting the money into single homes. They're, if, if they're buying property, trust me, it's going to be massive structures, okay? I'm going to read so you guys can understand what they are doing, though. However, what they, how they are, they're actually helping, they're helping the common man achieve their goal because a lot of banks are turning people away. Those interest rates are higher. So I, I'm going to just read it right here. It says, a number of other large asset management uh, managers and private equity firms are very active today in purchasing single family residences. BlackRock is sometimes confused with them. It says, uh, yeah. Below are facts on how do what on how we do participate in the U.S. real estate market combined. We are investing approximately 120 billion dollars in the U.S. residential real estate market on behalf of our clients. Okay, on behalf of their clients, so they're investing. They're investing. Okay, so it says providing capital for mortgages to help American families buy new homes. I'm going to read that again. Providing capital for mortgages to help American families buy new homes. Why? Because our economy is that shit. And they're here to kind of save the day for the most part. So instead of you paying Chase 
or, 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 or paying uh, whoever you may get your loan from or a rocket mortgage, instead of paying them, you would be going through them. Essentially, that's, that's, that's what this is. That's what they mean by investing. So it says BlackRock is a significant investor in, investor in mortgage securities, helping make capital available to individuals and families seeking to purchase homes. I read it. I read half of it. Helping make capital available. Capital is money. Capital is money. Okay, available to individuals and families seeking to purchase homes. So no, BlackRock's not running around town buying all these single family homes. If they want to, they could because they got the kind of money, but that's not what they're doing. They're investing in, essentially, they're, they're helping, they're making their profit just like the banks do. The bank doesn't come and just help you buy a house. They only do it because it benefits them long term. That's why they do it. They give you a 30-year mortgage and they accumulate interest for those 30 years. And by the time you're done paying a house that you agreed to pay for 300000 you end up paying sometimes double the amount. Pay attention. All right. It says, uh, uh, providing capital for new housing construction. Uh, it says, BlackRock is invested in several programs that are providing financing to build new homes and add to U.S. housing supply. So for those of you that aren't aware, what this is speaking to is that right now there is a high demand for home ownership and we have a low inventory. We don't have enough homes available for the folks that qualify and are interested in buying a home. That's another reason why these houses are overpriced, right? So inflation plays a role, but uh, uh, availability, right? Our inventory is low. So when you have less availability, you're going to have a higher demand, which means that we can play with the prices a little more. Going back to what I mentioned earlier about the gas prices, right? When the gas when the gas prices are high, it's because we don't we don't have that that much access to it as we would on no, on number under normal circumstances. So it says most recently we be, we we began investing in new construction, uh, purpose built for rent housing development um, that add supply to the market and add address to increasing demand. We see for this property type, our focus is on building single family rental housing that can be managed and operated similarly to multifamily properties with dedicated property management, leasing and amenities. OK, this is just uh, uh, another option for folks that would like the idea of living in a house, but aren't able to. Uh, save that deposit because people don't understand to buy a house it takes money so you need that deposit you need the closing um, if it's a new build then there's no inspection and things of that nature because it'll be covered by the builder but um, people don't understand how much it takes well, essentially what they're saying is yeah we're going to kind of make communities make makes these developments and when they make these developments uh, you maybe you can't afford to buy a home but hey we have a nice luxury home that you can come and rent that's what they're saying. There's nothing. I don't see nothing wrong with that. Okay. In fact, there's a company out there called. Um, you guys can look them up. They're called American Homes for Rent. Okay. They're large. They're all over the place, and they just recently built. I don't know uh, how many how many home uh, community and American Homes for Rent. They own all the homes that they rent. It's this is not like a management company where they manage homes for owners. No, literally, they own the homes and they rent them out. So if they can do it, why can't BlackRock do it? And they're investors. Why not? It's fair game, man. It's fair game. It says, other U.S. real estate investments. Additionally, BlackRock invests in multifamily properties, apartment complexes, and other residential real estate. Bottom line, BlackRock is an active investor in the U.S. real estate market, but we are not among the institutional investors buying single-family homes. So in other words, if y'all got a beef for somebody, it ain't them. That ain't who you got the beef with, all right? Your beef is with the guy that you follow on YouTube or Instagram that's trying to tell you uh, $10,000 and get a house. And he's not lying, but that's such what they're doing. They're running around buying every little house that they find that they can just put $10,000 into. They uh, refurbish or rehab it. They rent it out. And before you know it, this person has 30, 40, 50 properties. And when you want to buy it, they go, mm, not for sale, only for rent. That's who you should have to be for, all right? So I wanted to touch on this because I haven't really spoke on uh, the economy too much recently. And this is just, these are factors that I know. I don't think these are factors that I know will impact your life positively, 
but it will be negative if you don't get ahead of it, okay? Because remember what I read earlier, what I was telling you guys, okay? Within the next 18 months, we are going to experience some things that are not going to be comfortable, okay? Regardless of who's in office, okay? This is something that started back in 2020, and it probably won't end until, who knows, I don't know, 2030, which is where they're predicting the market to really take a, a major change. So do your best to get ahead of it, man. Um, invest into things that you know you can get your money right back. You know, the idea of taking physical money and putting it into a, a digital market and waiting for it to come back. I, I'm not a fan of it myself. Okay. Um, I am open to experimenting, but I'm not open to throwing large amounts of money into that. So this is the pod. I hope y'all got some something good out of it. Do your own research. Fact check me if y'all think you know that anything I said here isn't accurate. And I appreciate you guys for your time. I'll catch you on the next one. I'm Coach Fig, and I'm out of here.